Chapter 5, Technology, Hacking, and Secure Communications One of the most obvious shortcomings of this manual will be the lack of specifics in the fields of technology and hacking. The reason is that the hacking world moves and changes so fast that a manual such as this would be outdated to the point of laughter before I could consult the right people, translate from hackerese to American English, and publish it. Also, to a large extent, the hacker community has a far better grasp of most of the concepts outlined in this manual, since they have been in the fields fighting the good fight, taking serious risks, while the bulk of the liberty movement were either engaged in arguments on social media or waving signs at a 420 rally. Not to say social media and 420 rallies are bad, they just don't compare to being sentenced to three life sentences in a federal penitentiary for running a forum or being murdered and having it staged like a suicide because of a few lines of code. This is the reason that this manual is of the least value to the technology hacking activists, however, I will touch on a few items. Operation Security, or OPSEC, is a science in and of its own. I am neither qualified nor motivated to devote 500 pages to the topic. One partial reason is that by 2009, as I investigated Internet OPSEC, I became convinced that the typical Internet culture version of OPSEC was pretty much a faith-based fantasy. If you hold radical political beliefs, someone in a government office likely knows about it. They read or copy pretty much everything. Even if they aren't currently watching you and your specific activities, because they keep a record of almost everything, they can retroactively find out almost anything they want to know about you. A case in point is Ross Ulbricht, the alleged Dread Pirate Roberts. With an incredibly weak case against him, government investigators searched old entries at internet locations like the Mises Institute to build a dossier based on usernames similar to his and writing styles like his to determine an IP profile. Using weak connections like that, they focused in on Ross and warped the actual evidence in the case to convince a dim-witted jury that he was a devil incarnate. It didn't really matter if Ross was innocent, guilty, or anywhere in between. He was their target, and they were going to catch him and make an example of him simply because slave masters love to beat the whipping boy, and Ross was a textbook whipping boy. Now consider the case of Matt DeHart, former U.S. Air National Guard intelligence analyst allegedly involved in an attempt to expose the CIA's involvement in the 2001 anthrax scare. Without enough actual evidence to convict Matt, authorities chose to seize his computers and plant images resulting in child pornography charges. One may ask why so much time and effort was invested into the Ulbricht case when they could have just faked the evidence like they did in the DeHart case. The obvious answer is hidden in the fact that government agents working on the Dread Pirate Roberts case have been proven guilty of absconding with a fortune in Bitcoin that they stole from the Silk Road, and no such source of funding was available in the DeHart case. So they took the easy, time-tested route of planting evidence on computer hard drives that the government had complete access to with no way to prove it wasn't Matt's pornography. So does that mean we should just throw caution to the wind and forget about internet security and private communications? Not at all. It means those in the underground should not worry about or try to be totally invisible, but we should learn and practice communicating in ways that assure the best security that is possible for the things that matter. One thing that helps us do that is that the above-ground activists practice secure communications for things that don't need to be private, if for no other reason, to keep the watchers busy watching things that don't matter. Chapter 5, Section 1, Secure Communications As covered above in regards to activist networks, communication systems can be centralized, decentralized, or distributed in structure. An example of a currently working 2016 distributed communication system that provides good functionality but doesn't rely on any centralized host is Tox, Tox Tox.chat. It allows private chat, group chat, and file sharing and is encrypted end-to-end, although the PC itself can still be compromised. It's a direct replacement for unsecured chat and secured chat that is centrally hosted. Currently, the download and use are free of charge. 
Another distributed project which is way more comprehensive towards secure communications and file sharing is RetroShare and is more like a private bulletin board system where you can post files and messages for others to download later. Neither of these two are very hard to set up, but they do both require the participants to somehow exchange their keys, preferably in a secure way, in order to connect to each other. Coupling either of the two distributed systems above with an operating system like Tails, which gives out-of-the-box anonymity over Tor, can give us a private secure setup like we've never seen before, and it's not too hard to set up. There are other systems like this coming out all the time, making the idea of putting such a topic in print seem rather silly.